And so the relationship, just like other regions of the system, the loans and cerebral cortex, which are basically our highest motor system and our highest sensory receptive system, uh, neocortinals, the, the latest area of the cortex, the most recent area of the cortex, develop into basically five lobes, four of which are considered to be neocortical or contemporary. Frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. But also there's a lobe that they kind of expanded on top of, which is the most ancient lobe of the, uh, of the cerebral cortex. And that is called the limbic lobe, or the, uh, called the insulin. Yeah. 
from the uh, anterior commissure down to this area. This is the optic chiasm. This is the optic crossover. Okay. So that, head, that down well, between this area, this anterior posterior fiber group uh, from the anterior commissure back, that's called the fornix. That's an association pattern. Association pathways will see go from back to front to front to back. And then between the corpus callosum and the fornix, there's typically really just it's a connective tissue of system. There's no, no really neuron populations in it. It's called the, the transparent septum or the septum pellucid. Okay? And that's covering a chamber on the inside. We'll talk about those, I think, a couple of weeks. Um, a cerebral spinal fluid chamber called a lateral ventricle. This would be the left cerebral cortical hemisphere, so this would be the left ventricle. All right, now below that is the, this is all telencephalic, part of the prosencephalon, the highest part of the brain. Uh, this is the diencephalic, also part of the prosencephalon, but down below the telencephalon, the cerebral that's also the basal nucleus. You see some areas here which are stippled. Okay? These are interesting because this, this cortical gyrus here, called the cingulate gyrus, is an interconnection between the neocortex and the more primitive area of the cortex here, coming down here to this structure here. This, it, this little bump here is called an uncus, a nose, or a hook, actually, as it hooks around down below. And this is uh, called the hippocampus, you know, behind the uncus, behind the nose. And this gyrus from the cingulate cortex to the hippocampus is called the perihippocampal gyrus. This hippocampus, I think Christina Guire is going to talk about some consciousness, which is pretty much an emotional, habitual cortex type of an area. So that is an area where short-term memory goes. Okay? How long did I tell you it takes to become long-term memory? Mm -hmm. Forgot that word. See? You haven't gotten it. You haven't gotten it in the past. Okay? It takes about 10 years. For short-term memory, you become long-term memory. I, I, I say you're kidding me, I'm facetious because that's why I'm facetious. Uh, someday you're going to sit there with a patient and talk about something like that. And, 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 Okay. 
So now, on this moraine specimen, they cut away a piece of the temporal lobe, usually by just pulling the temporal lobe away off of the number of that lab. You can see these gyri here aren't quite as big as these gyri out here. This is neocortex. This is archicortex. This, these short, smaller gyri are part of what we refer to as the insula, the lion insula, the emotional habitual cortex, the limbic system. So some of the differences between archicortex and neocortex is neocortex typically will see the layer in a minute. The neocortex has six well-defined layers in its gyro, in particular in the motor gyro. Okay? The insular cortex at most has three. The insular cortex at most has three defined layers. So neocortex, six defined layers, Six, the insular cortex, three defined layers like one and two. Okay, so now let's look at that. Okay, here's a more colorful look. This is what Broadman did. Now, you can count them if you want, okay? You can count them if you want, but each one of these shapes is a different shape. And that's what Broadman did, okay? He counted as many as 47 to, some people think, 54 different shapes on his sheet of paper. He didn't have a computer. He did not do this graphic. Somebody else did this graphic. I admire the They probably just took the black and white image that he made and they just color you know, in the background. So these are Broadman's, this is Broadman's what we call a cyto-architectural map. So he, for every area he looked at, and they are numbered based upon from what was the first area he looked at to what was the 47th. 50th number that he looked at. Most people think 47 that there's something kind of hidden in here, so there's some way to be his eyes. But the ones you can see, the 47 you can see, have a different cell body shape. That's what he looked at. I mean, we're not talking about really high power magnification. We're talking about what, late 1800s, early 1900s, something like that. So this is his cyto architectural map. Now he had an associate. You know, he did science with like economists. And he had an associate named Von Economy, who was also a German scientist. Okay? And Von Economo said no, it's got to be. So Von Economo did a similar map, but he says he found 115 different scientists. So being being humans, okay? 47, 150, 47, 150. We're going to go with 47. That's enough. So typically, when they talk about Broadman site architectural map, they talk about his specifically 47 different areas of cell cell shapes in his site architecture. Okay. So the neocortex is also considered the homotypical cortex, the homogenetic cortex. It's six layered, four of the five lobes, okay? Which is the one that's not. Which is the one that's not. Six layered, okay, it's the arc of the cortex. That is the, this is the, the insular cortex. Okay? But this, the homogenetic cortex, is the five lobes of man, um, yeah, okay? Also known as hypotypical, Isocortex, neocortex, neopalatum, or the super limbic system. So this is 90% of the cortex is six layer. 
the heterogenetic cortex has no more than five, but usually three. Okay? Also known as the heterotypical allocortex, old cord or old pallium, archipallium. These are areas such as the hippocampus, uh, the dentate, uh, the dentate nucleus of the limbic cortex, the uh, cingulate gyrus area as it becomes a very campal gyrus, uh, the paleo pallium, that's part of the olfactory cortex, we'll talk about that again. The juxto allo or mesio cortex, cingular gyrus, insula, or typically heterogenetic cortex, so about 10% of the cortex does not have six defined limbs. Okay, so we can subdivide it to what are areas that are input areas and which are output areas. So the major of these cortical regions are more recent from the evolutionary cortex and all contain six layers. So the outermost layer we'll see is called the molecular layer. Okay? Uh, the molecular layer is really the terminal point of information that is coming in to the to the cerebral cortex, but it also can be the beginning of output, at least within the confines of the cortex, not totally out, out not the parental cell of pets, but maybe affecting the parental cell of pets, which are more internal. Okay? However, we've got uh, here, we've got the So the molecular layer, I can't, maybe I can't do this. <coughs> okay. Is it supposed to line up with this? Yes. So the molecular layer would be the molecular layer here.
primary nerve cell bodies that are going to give off the information or coalesce the motor information are going to be actually in the sixth layer, all six layers in the gray matter of the cerebral cortex. Okay? So there is a cell there that runs tangentially or parallel to the surface. And that was described by a famous neuroanatomist named Cajal. So these are called the tangential or the horizontal cells of Cajal. Okay? There are also supportive cells in there, neuroglia cells in there. That's what neuroglia does. It's supporting the neurons. Okay? Then we go into layer two, and there's a lot of smaller cells, all kinds that are either small granule cells, tiny little ball-like cells. There are tiny perennial cells. Uh, there's a Mark 9 cell, which kind of has a nondescript, almost a fusiform type cell body in it. And these extend, these dendrites extend to layer one, okay? So this is receiving information as well. This one is probably receiving information from many of the deep layers, not, in, so to speak, the external pyramidal layers or internal pyramidal layers, but from all of the other layers that are receiving that are uh, receiving information. So for example, what's happening here is that there's information that's coming in here and the axons may go down to lower layers of gray matter for as, as deep as the next layer down or deeper. So layer three, four, maybe layer five, maybe layer six. But they also send information up here to the white. Then we've got here layer three, external or medial pyramidal layer. These are medium-sized pyramidal nuclei. And they have dendrites which extend once again to layer one. So it's output, okay? But the output doesn't really leave the cerebral cortex, okay? Like, for example, a cortical spinal, right? Large cortical cells. So what it does is it may go to fibers that interconnect the left and right cerebral cortex through the through the options, in particular through the corpus callosum. Or they may go from pathways that go from front to back or back to front or association pathways. Okay, so they're drawing on or supplying information to areas that are pretty much within the cerebral cortex. They're not leaving the cerebral cortex. Then four is not another granular layer. There's some set small cells there that look like stars, so they call them cellite cells. There's some more Maranati cells in there. In this area, there's a lot of transmission of fibers within the layer, within the, this layer running from side to side in the layer, okay? Almost like in a layer one, where the Cajal cells are par parallel to the outer layer. These fibers are closely packed fibers integrating information that's within the cortex itself, okay? They are receiving input from the thalamus, ventral posterior lateral nucleus, ventral posterior medial nucleus, probably ventral lateral nucleus, definitely thalamic. These are thalamic fibers. This is information that's being relayed there. Okay? But from the same standpoint, if you see this, it appears like a very dark band between the bottom of this layer and the top of the next layer. And this is described as violet band. Okay? So this was the in, this was the external band of violet. More outer band, okay, in the central brain. Okay? Geniculate bindings of vision, okay, uh, our, our hearing, okay. So these are all thalamic input into this granular cell layer, which is collating within itself all of this information to distribute probably to the higher, la higher layers or lower layers or within the confines of this layer or lamina. The next layer is what I was talking about before. This is the internal pyramidal layer, or it's sometimes called the ganglionic layer. These are the medium 
to very large pyramidal cells described by Betts. These are the pyramidal cells of Betts. These are very large pyramid-shaped nuclei. Okay? These are the beginnings of the corticospinal system. You will see large aggregation of these both in, in the precentral gyrus but also in the supplementary motor cortex associated with movement patterns. So there's also stellate cells and Martinotti cells. Uh, there, a lot of the input cells, once again, are horizontally arranged, okay? And therefore, they also create a band not quite as dark or as thick as the external band of bilogger, but they are now down on the bottom of a layer five, so there's a layer of bilogger above uh, layer five and a layer below layer five, between five and six, and the external between four and five, that form this now internal, uh, internal, uh, oh yeah, let's go down, okay. So this is at the, between uh, four and five, that's <coughs> external band of bilogger. Uh, here, this should be internal band of bilogger, not external band of bilogger. This should be internal band of bilogger. This is the origin of the cortical spinal system, the pyramidal system. And some people believe that's why we call it the pyramidal system. All right, um, layer six, the innermost layer. Now remember, all of these layers are in the gray matter of the cerebral cortex. So remember when you, you cut, you cut through the cerebral cortex, you can see this tawny, this tawny band of cells, and below it, coming and going to it, were these fibers, these pathways coming and going from it, the white matter, okay, the processes. Okay, the six layers multiform, or sometimes called uh, polymorphic. Many of them are fusiform cells. They could be, they could be Martinotti cells. Uh, these are a lot of either cells that are entering to it from the white matter. So in this case, these are pathways that are believed to be corticostriate. These are the pathways that go from the cerebral cortex to the basal nuclei to the striatum. Corticothalamic are pathways that are returning from the cerebral cortex to the thalamus to essentially get some type of, some more information in relationship to the information that the thalamus is getting the cerebral cortex. Okay. So either corticostriate or corticothalamic. Not thalamic cortical, but corticothalamic. BPL, BPM, uh, these are uh, the lamocortical. Okay, so the granular areas of the cortex, okay, uh, areas two and four receive a lot of now thalamocortical fibers, uh, primarily, uh, primarily in relationship to the postcentral gyrus. Okay, that makes sense. That's the gyrus that's receiving all of this information in relationship to sensory areas. <coughs> okay, um, the superior temporal gyrus. Okay, it's interesting, we'll talk about that in the middle. Some things go wrong with that. You can get some really weird out outcomes, okay? Or the hippocampus. What's the hippocampus? The hippocampus is this area that starts storing uh, short-term memory, okay? Then there's an agranular cortex um, in relationship to distinct the distinguishable from two and four. This is layers three and five. So these are where the, where the, the there's less granular cells, but there's more granular cells. Okay? The external pyramidal and the internal pyramidal or, or ganglionic or Large cells with many parent fibers uh, in the precentral gyrus and the frontal cortex. Okay? Frontal cortex areas such as the supplementary motor cortex. Supplementary motor cortex. So that's what that we're trying to distinguish here. So to have some idea of what the primary areas are in relationship to some cortical function, you know, whether they're just what we would call cell populations inside of the core, inside of the cortex, inside of the cortex, are typically for the most part association, memory, memory. So when we're going fibers from front to back, 
we are really talking about engaging areas of memory, whether it's in regards to sensations or movements or, or new information that we're getting to see. Okay. So I want you to remember the shapes of all of these things in these same sections. This is Golgi, Nissel, and Weingart. These were the guys that sang everything that you had to look at in histology. Okay. Uh, they were all, they were all, interestingly enough, came out, you know, kind of black and a white background. But the difference is, is that if you look at the Golgi, at the Golgi stain, he stains most of the neuron. Most of the neuron. He's got the cells. He's got the cells there. Here you see, here you see a large pyramidal cell at layer five. Okay. Here we see a lot of tiny cells at layer three. That's the external pyramidal layer, but they're still pyramidal. Okay. We don't really see a lot of the smaller cells. However, in here, because there are some tiny little pyramidal cells, we do see those cells, but they've got very short processes. We don't see those processes. So that's in the Golgi state. We pretty much can see the whole neuron. If we go over to Nissel, Nissel, what, what, what did Nissel do? He stained chromatin. He stained chromatin. So all, any cell population in here that had any type of nuclear chromatin okay, in it came out. And obviously, the large cells appear larger than a lot of the granular cells and the stellate cells. And, so and then Weiger, he didn't care. Weiger, but it's interesting because what he did here, because it does show some areas very well. So he stained the fibers. He stained the fibers. So pretty much that was a silver stain. That's what silver stain is called. It stains a kind of the fibers. Okay. So here in layer one, you see this. Like these up here, these are these uh, Cajal cells, cells of Cajal. But then their short processes pretty much stay in the outer layer. And they would stain to create this band. Okay, he's just, just showing part of it here, that are tangential to the surface. surface. So these were sometimes described by another neuroscientist named Residence. And this is called the tangential layer of Residence. Okay, 
okay, and then this is a little bit easier to follow. Someone said, okay, I don't need all of that stuff that I told you in this one. Let's just show that if you look at these larger cells, okay, either a larger, uh, larger granular cell or about, you can see here, this is a pyramidal cell here. You can see here in layer two, this is small pyramidal cells, but the cells are not leaving. The fibers are not leaving the cerebral cortex. Okay? Uh, kind of look like these cells associated, if you remember I talked about this little space in Surrounding the uh, surrounding the rosette of the cerebellum um, as these mossy fibers came in, and then but they there are pyramidal cells here that go within the cortex. Here, layer three, there's an external pyramidal layer. These some of these cells will leave the cortex. Get here, granular set, another granular layer. Most of these cells they may extend upward to. A layer one, but they do not typically leave the cortex. They stay in the internal granular layer, and that's what causes this external band of bilocker. Then we get down here to layer five, and we see these there. Here's an argon cell. Okay, this fusiform cell. And that here is a pyramidal cell like that's these are outputs. Everything else here, these are sensory fibers, pretty much probably located in the most central fibers that are not just coming into the motor cortex, but primarily into the sensory cortex. These are all inputs. Okay, if that wasn't helpful. Okay, we have these in the label, the artist is labeling the cell types. They put them down here with the letters. It's cells up here, here's a pyramidal cell up here in layer two, here we come down into this layer here, layer five, not only do you get larger pyramidal cells, but you color code them, so the smaller pyramidal cell is black, the larger pyramidal cell is blue, I think you kind of was, you know, felt this favorite, you felt that these layer three cells were more his style, it's a sheet larger. And then a lot of pyramidal cells, especially in this layer four, okay, here, um, and, but this is a, coming in here, is a pyramidal cell in layer three, here leaving is a pyramidal cell that's high up, receiving information from layer one, and taking it outside the cortex, here is some more internal intercommunication, here once again, receiving information from layer one, and taking information out, over here now, Got specific acorns. This is information that's coming in two granular cells, possibly to a granular cell, uh, probably possibly to a cell in cell here, or a line cell in here. And then here's a, here's a, a very elaborate uh, cell that is receiving information, which it should have since we're not the same anymore. It's getting the most of the jobs in the good and increasing. Okay, now it says specific area, that's a specific, specific sensation, specific area entity. Here it says association area, that's coming from an area of memory. Association is memory. So let's just go through this. So the eight area input, where's it coming from? Cortical, cortical, that's within the cortex. Those are so really association patterns. Thalmocortical, from the thalamus to the cortex. Uh, the forebrain, these areas of gyri refer to as the prefrontal cortex or front, uh, run, uh, area 9, 9, 10, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, locus ceruleus. Where's locus ceruleus? <coughs> so that's, that's not. Where is that? Where do you find locus ceruleus? Lumens. What part of the central nervous system? The belt. Okay, so in the wrapping, okay, that's information that's coming from the wrapping, the nucleus wrapping, magnus or other wrapping, nuclei that's ascending in the 
relationship and possible stimulation from fibers associated with sensitive sensations, primarily pain. Okay, efferent output. Okay, we've got three different types of efferent output. We've got association fibers. Association is memory areas. These are pathways that go from the back of the cortex to the front of the cortex, or from the front of the cortex to the back of the cortex. The visual fibers. And this is my definition of each one of these pathways. The visual fibers go from the left side of the cortex to the right side of the cortex. From the right side of the cortex to the left side. So the corpus callosum is the largest extent of that. The other next size is the anterior commissure associated with the sensation itself. Projection fibers. These are things that primarily project out of the cerebral cortex cortical layers to other layers of the nervous system, including the brain stem and the spinal cord system. Corticospinal projections, corticostriate projections, corticolimic projections, and so forth. But also, it may be fibers that are ascending apparently in relationship to thombocortical or uh, locus serous or back because they're kind of bundled together in the pedals, in the internal capsule. Okay. So, association fibers travel anteriorly or posteriorly, basically back and forth. They can be very short and go from one gyrus to another, or they can be very long and go from one lobe to another. So in an area, and we'll see this in a, in a minute, superior longitudinal positions from the frontal lobe to the occipital. From the frontal lobe to the occipital. Okay. What? What's interesting in here, okay, the frontal lobe is much associated not only with motor activity but far in front of it, like in the prefrontal cortex. Things associated in the story of relationship to you know emotional and visual stuff. Okay, the occipital lobes are things that we see. Okay. The inferior longitudinal particulars from the temporal lobe to the occipital lobes are not quite as long, but now we're correlating things associated with things such as language or hearing, with things such as vision, the speech. The arcuate vesiculus, we talk about this in a few minutes, um, from the focus area of the frontal lobe, that's down in the area of 44 and 45, province areas 44 and 45, to the vernix area, which is province area 22. The focus area is the area of Basically, um, speech output. Okay. Speech output. Okay. Your next area is an area associated with being able to form words and sentences and to understand what it is you're seeing, or basically what we are going to learn. So, this is understanding language as opposed to expressing language. Once the fasciculus, the humpus is that little tip of the tip of the perihippocampal gyrus. So that is also all very far forward, receives area from the frontal lobe, which is emotional cortex, which makes sense here, to the area of the anterior temporal lobe. And the area of the anterior temporal lobe will look at more when we look at the sense of smell. There are areas such as the amygdaloid nucleus, uh, the piriform nucleus associated with things like the sense of smell. And then the cingulum, the cingulate to the hippocampus. Okay, remember the cingulate gyrus is that area just below the neocortex, and it is sending information from the neocortex to the limbic cortex, so the insulin associated with the hippocampus gyrus. The visual fibers, that's kind of easy. Corpus callosum, anterior commissure. There's a the posterior commissure which in interconnects the the uh, areas just in front of the tectum and the midbrain on each side, okay? Anterior commissure interconnects the right and the left uh, areas of the medial olfactory tract or spine. And it's your Westfall nucleus, also is a nucleus that sends information into the 
into this this ganglion referred to as the um, as the ciliary ganglion, but it sends it to the opposite side. Okay, it sends it to the opposite side. Okay, and then once again, projection fibers for the spinal tract, lateral tract. Okay, upper motor neurons, the spinal lower motor neurons. Cortical vulvar, upper motor neurons to upper to neurons of the brain, cranial nerve, and lower motor neurons. Okay, so both of these are affecting alpha motor neurons, but some of them in the spinal cord, some of them are in the brain. Okay, cortical pati from the cortex of the pons. These are going to interconnect to the cerebellum. These are ponti nuclei are relays from the cerebral cortex of the cerebellum. <coughs> Corticostriate from the cortex of the basal nuclei. Connects the cerebral cortex to the basal nuclei, primarily the striatum, the putamen and the cardiac. Thalmocortical interconnects the thalamus, interconnects the cortex with the, with the thalamus. In this case, the thalamus through the Take uh, five minutes. Fibers. This is the corona radiata, both inplay fibers, but also exploited fibers. These are all <coughs> projection fibers coming from the cerebral cortical neurons and giving off fiber tracks. This is 
the globus pallidus here on this more lateral side. This in the middle here would be the third ventricle. Okay, here's an ampullary bonds, okay, or a fornix. So here is the caudate head. Here's the upper portion of the lobus pallidus, both externa and interna. Here's the putamen. So over here, this is corona radiata coalescing into the anterior limb of the internal capsule and coalescing into this bundle here and also a more, a more lateral bundle. This is, the, this is the area that is referred to as the bend or the genin of the internal capsule going from the anterior portion to posterior portion. So this is the posterior portion of the lobus pallidus and penis. Over here is the thalamic nuclei. Down here are the mammillary bodies, part of the hypothalamus. Yeah. Or genetic bodies, I'm sorry. Part of the thalamus. So this is the internal capsule. Anterior portion, posterior portion. Now here is ATL. That's anterior portion of the anterior portion of the body. This is trunk and or this is arm and trunk and leg. These are so so metatopically arranged in relationship. So this is the internal capsule. So interestingly enough, in relationship to a stroke, okay, I did not have a cerebral cortical lesion. I had a lesion of the internal capsule. And these are called lenticular vessels that were blocked that caused me to have that lesion. But since, in particular, the things that run through here are similar in relationship to both projection cortical fibers and projection sensory fibers, I had similar effects that I would have if I would have had a higher cortical These are coalescing here, and a lot of people can have these. You're called, uh, this, this is called the lenticular area, okay? Area of the internal capsule. Alright, let's talk about cerebral cortical function. Okay, so we can generate the cerebral cortex into four primary areas, an area that's primarily sensory, an area that's primarily motor, an area that in relationship to memory is unimodal. In other words, this is, this is adjacent to each primary sensory area up here, but it is, but it is primarily a one type of sensory receptive uh, storage area, association area. Multimodal areas in relationship to memory, and that's what association is its memory. Okay? We have areas that are not motor in function. Uh, they receive several different types of sensory modalities. So, they are so here they're color coded. Okay? So areas that receive uh, in relationship to being unimodal, one type of sensory input, or areas like in here, here, here we've got the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe. Here in relation primarily hearing, language, even you know, some aspects of uh, the sense of uh, the sense of uh, motor output in relationship to feeding. Okay. Uh, also here, the blue is the primary somatic sensory cortex of the postcentral gyrus. This back here is called the uh, supramarginal gyrus and superior superior temporal lobule here. These are also unimodal in relationship to certain things like having an awareness of your environment. Uh, then we've got areas uh, that are multimodal, okay? This is the prefrontal cortex. A lot of information, a lot of different things is being stored here. Okay? This is your habitual behavioral uh, memory storage. Primary motor is the precentral gyrus. This area that's red stripe, that's the supplementary motor cortex. So 
So this is area four, this is area six. Primary sensory is in blue. Olympic cortex now we see that on the other side. With also the, the uh, unimodal cortex here. A little bit of multimodal coming over, over the top, behind the, uh, right over here, behind the, the area of the parietal lobe. This is a, uh, this is a simulate gyrus and interconnecting to the, interconnecting to the hippocampus. So that's the limiting system. So different types of association areas, but also specifically areas associated with motor output and the sensory. One question about the last picture. Um, so the Central. It's an interconnection between the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus on the medial side, upper medial side of the cortex. Okay, so what's a cortex multimodal area is associated with? We're associated with the ability to communicate using language, uh, our ability to reason or extrapolate future events on the basis of present experiences or past experiences. Make complex and long range plants. Okay, like you know, you know, last year you came to the school, you know, you have a plant. I hope you still are, I hope you still are on the track to keep that plant, you know. Uh, or to imagine creating things that have never existed. That's kind of exciting. You know, maybe someday you can, you can follow the path of, uh, of uh, Bill Gates or. Who's the Facebook guy? Okay. Now, are you on the Facebook dating site? You see that? That's his latest. That's his latest thing. Talk about keeping keeping information private. You know. Okay. There we go. Frontal lobe. Precentral gyrus is the primary volitional motor cortex, more than zero. Uh, this probably is, is incorrect. Okay? It should be 90% of the cortical spinal cord. And that's both from the precentral gyrus as well as the, um, maybe that's what I was doing, separately. the precentral gyrus in relationship with supplementary cortex. It has a homocular. 50% uh, it's interesting. And the motor cortex controls the tongue, lips, and larynx. And hand, contralateral. Contralateral. Okay? Motor output, since it's primarily corticospinal, crosses to the opposite side. Motor initiation may be preceded by information coming through the thalamus from the basal nuclei and the cerebellum because they are there to modify what the motor information the cortex originally gave to them. And they're going to sit back and say, okay, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, with a nice smooth coordinated movement of the brain out. Lesions of the upper motor neuron, uh, neuron effects uh, in relationship to this once again. This is uh, these effects are things associated with like uh, paralysis, hemi, hemi, uh, hemi paralysis or, uh, in relationship to this one side of the body, one half of the body, um, loss of the ability to perform motor, especially sophisticated motor movement. Premotor cortex area six is six times larger than your ear. What is this area associated with? Movement patterns. That makes sense. Okay, so it's taking the information on what the cortex or what your brain wants to output. And it's saying, okay, um, this is how this is how we throw a baseball 90 miles an hour on the inside corner of the plate with the power. So this is something that is a movement pattern that that individual has to master in order to do. 
gives rise along with the supplementary motor cortex on the medial side to 20% of the spinal cord. So that's basically, basically 100% of the corticospinal pathway is strictly corticospinal and corticobulbar, but also we have information arising from the supplementary motor cortex, which would give the rest of the corticospinal pathway the more immune system. So for the pre just go back to the 80-90%, so it's 80% of it coming from the cortical spinal tract? 20%, 20% coming, 80% of it coming from the pre-central gyrus. 20% of it coming from the primary motor cortex, okay, the supplementary motor cortex, the pre-motor cortex. Okay, so premotor cortex has control of proximal and axial muscles. Okay, the proximal muscles are the muscles of the, the shoulders and thigh regions of the body. The axial muscles are the trunk. Okay, it, it, it is there in preparation of movement, movement patterns, and movement planning. Now, there's an area that is primarily on the upper medial side of the premotor cortex, which is many times itself just called the supplementary motor cortex. It's still Rodman's area of six, but it's a little bit more sophisticated in its relationship to the programming of patterns and sequences of complex movement, of complex movement patterns. Always active during speech. Okay, and that makes sense. This is, you know, speech, speech is not easy. Speech is not easy, okay? Um, axial and trunk and proximal limb girdles, and it receives a lot of information from visual in out visual in sorry, visual in. Okay. So if you have a supplementary motor cortex area lesion, you have a loss of movement or an akinesia. That's a that's a simple term. Or an apraxia. Okay. So what's an apraxia? is the inability to perform a movement or a movement pattern when asked to do so or upon command. For example, a apraxia could be something that this individual over the course of their life was a carpenter, but now they have this supplementary cortical area lesion. And now they know what a hammer is. They know what a nail is. They know what a board is. They know what you do with them. But they can't do it. They can't pick up the hammer and nail the nail into it. And even if you ask them, even if you put the hammer, they have lost the ability to, to complete this movement pattern with things that they know. Frontal eye fields, contralateral conjugate deviation of movements without correct visual input. So these are the things that basically allow us or cause us as light hits our retina surface or we see things out in front of us to basically follow them. Basically follow them, kind of lock on them and take them all the way and scan with our eyes, okay? Now this movement has to end because as the eyes are scanning, they can only go so far. So when they snap back, that movement is called the stagnus. That's a word that is a resetting of the visual fields as they are scanning. Okay. As they are scanning. So we can have problems with this because we can have problems where this area or an optic nerve, or not optic nerve problems, but ocular motor problems things like that, and we are, you know, basically, not, for whatever reason, we've got spasms of extraocular muscles, or we got twitches of extraocular muscles, and we get this extraneous scanning, and we're losing our ability to focus on the object. And so what are the, what are the muscles involved? They're the muscles that by cranial nerve 3, cranial nerve 4, and cranial nerve 6. Okay, ocular motor, Procure. 
and, and do something. Okay? So typically if there is a if there is a lesion, okay, what happens is because this is a, this is essentially coming from areas of the brain cells, this is a, a cross pathway, but on this particular occasion, if there's a lesion, the deviations are the same side as the lesion. So if the lesion is on the right, that's my right here. If the lesion was on the left, your eyes would be deviated to the left. Okay, so you kind of be If it was on the right, you would deviate to the left. Okay? And you would be locked or you would be able to get back. So when we move and we scan and it snaps back, that's called a post-rotatory nystagmus. Atypical movements are simply called some type of a defective nystagmus. Okay? In other words, there's movement like locking in one, in one side or the other. That's atypical. Typical is as you rotate your eyes, you get to the end, your eyes snap back and move. That's a post rotatory nystagmus. Okay, prefrontal cortex, uh, broad area 9 to 12. 46, 45, 47. This is an association cortical area. This is associated with abstract thinking and decision making. This is anticipation of effects of a particular course of action or social behavior. Okay? Um, so essentially, if you have lesions in this area, you are essentially a social being. Okay? You, you know, you don't get well along with others in the environment where you have a tendency to have very isolated type behaviors in relationship to precarious behavior or things like that. Uh, you say things, once again, like a Tourette's type thing that are out of, out of context with what your environment. You think things that are not really going on, okay? So this is an area associated with deviation or some other type of behavior. Social behavior, some ways we all have some bad social behavior. So that's, a, that's not really, doesn't mean you necessarily have a lesion. Oh, I don't know. I have to see in action. Okay, so lesions, inappropriate social behavior, loss of judgment, loss of initiative to do anything, loss of foresight. Okay? Loss of the ability to see what the consequences of your actions are. Okay? Poor concentration. Okay? Maybe it usually isn't totally, uh, totally linked to things like, um, like you know, developmental speech <coughs> and things like in relationship to that. Okay? Uh, tendency towards you, euphoria. Okay? Now this could have been because of in all honesty, in a relationship to drugs you may be taking, okay? Um, but this is an area that's affected more by that. Schizophrenia, okay? You're not euphoric, you're basically at least more than one person in a given point of time. So incoherence of thought. Broca's motor speech area is Brodman's area uh, 44 and 45. Motor speech area, production of speech, making sounds, making language, may be able to say language, say words, say sentences. Okay? It is primarily a left-sided dominant phenomenon. Okay? Most of the Broca's areas on the left have more of a significant output to areas like your tongue, your lips, your cheeks on the opposite side. Okay? They are interconnected to an area called the vernix area on the superior temporal gyrus. We'll talk about this in a little bit. This is Broadman's area 22. Okay? So a loss of language or speech is called an evasion. A loss of speech or language is called an evasion. The inability to express speech, in, in basically in sounds, okay, shape words correctly and so forth, say something, okay, 
He is what's referred to as brokenness or an expressive declaration. You cannot express the words that you know the words are and you know what you want to say, but they do not come out well. Some people believe this is an area that affects things like stuttering, um, things associated with that. Okay, here's the motor homunculus again. Okay, and we're at the sort of humanoid image. This is over the precentral gyrus. The largest output in relationship is to the hands and to the face in particular, the face and associated world camera. Okay, let's go behind the central sulcus to the parietal. Okay. All right, the first three cell populations that Broca looked at were area one, area two, and area three, okay? All the stuff that came after that in relationship to what these cells done pretty much came after Broca, okay? But the numbering is attributed to Broca's cytoindexual map. So this is all in the post-central gyrus, the primary, primary somatosensory cortex. So somatosensory sensations coming from the body, per se, not really special sensations, because those are located in very specific areas of the cerebral cortex. But general sensations are coming in here via the thalamus, natural posterior lateral nucleus, natural posterior medial nucleus, possibly some other areas associated with input to the cortex from the thalamus. Okay. It has a homuncular pattern as well. It is also a representation. The sensory input is coming from the opposite side. So there is a cross pattern. It is modality. It's a modality discrete areas. What's a modality? It's a type of sensory function. Okay. So remember when we were talking about we were talking about sensations, we were talking about receptors. We talked about these receptors called Spontaneous receptors that are free nerve endings of pain temperature. Slowly adapting. That's in Broadman's area one. Okay, in the middle. Okay, pain temperature. Rapidly adapting receptors. Okay, uh, things that were not a lot of encapsulated and so forth. Uh, these were receptors that were, you know, like touch and pressure, okay, uh, mechanical types of activities, but not appropriate reception. Appropriate reception is in this area of, um, of area three. Three A is believed to come from joints specifically as opposed to muscles. Area three A is associated with that. Area three is associated with all other appropriate receptors, including Possibly information coming from Pacinian corpus, okay, that are associated with associated with your um, coverings, your coverings of bone. So it receives most of its input from the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, ventral posterior medial nucleus. Lesions cause either a paresthesia, okay, so a paresis was a little bit worse. Paralysis was a complete. Paresthesia is some type of altered sensation. You wouldn't expect this sensation coming from these receptors. It's an altered sensation, either lessened or not typical for the receptors that are giving rise to this, or the pathways. Or anesthesia, okay, loss of sensation. Okay, then we go to what's called the Posterior parietal cortical areas, the areas behind the most central gyrus. These are sensory association cortical areas. Superior parietal lobule is an area that is multimodal. It receives information, the, the Broadman's area 5 receives information in regards to tactile discrimination and stereognosia, the, <coughs> the shape of something that you are, are feeling or touching. Uh, area 7 plays a role in movements which are guided by visual input. So the, this is an area that is coming 
coming from the visual cortex to here that is playing a role in this. Okay, these are multiple mold. A stereotype motion, we talked about that. That is the loss of the ability to detect the shape of an object, the shape and texture of an object. Okay? It's also called a static motion. Okay, now there's an interesting thing that happens on the non-dominant side. The non-dominant side is typically if you're right-handed, it's the left side. Okay? So the non-dominant side is the right side. If you have a lesion in this area, you could have a condition called contralateral neglect, or contralateral hemineglect. Primarily right side, okay? It can contribute to an impraxin. In other words, and, but it can also be impacted by a lesion in area six in the frontal, frontal. This is a real interesting concept. When I was a graduate student, I worked in a neurology and so I was so fascinated with the things that the patients presented to me. This is back in the early 70s that I moved my desk so I could always see what's coming down the hall. Okay? I'll show you a little bit. This is somebody that has contralateral hemiplegic. He knew what his right side was about but he lost his left side. He could look in a mirror and not see this. He would lose the left side of a clock face and not see the numbers on that. This is someone who has contralateral hernia. You can't really see it, but he's got a better haircut. He's got a very better haircut on his right side than he has on his left side. But he didn't, he didn't see this. Somebody's, or what I would see, I would see patients coming down the hallway. They would have their right hand in the sleeve of their shirt, and the left hand would not be in the sleeve of their shirt. Or they would come down the hallway. Usually, they came in with somebody trying to make sure they put the appropriate. But you know, sometimes they got you know they got past their current, and so like right leg in their pants, left leg out not having any idea of what was going on on the left side of the body. They basically lost the left side of their mind, contrary to the main It's not the only area that causes this, but it's a primary area. Problems are in five and seven is period right along. Question. Yes. So are they able to walk properly? Because if they... Well, not if they had one leg and they're not getting it. They're always tripping them with that, but they're loose leg. Depends how they're coming in. Okay. They may have problems walking because they don't see the left side of the world. Okay. So they bump into things. They bump into things. Or they don't see how close they are to the wall. You know, so they'll bump into the wall. Do you see a mirror image of your, your good side? They can look in the mirror, but they, they can see it, but they don't recognize it. Very nice. Very difficult to resolve. Okay. Supermarginal gyrus is directly behind or below the central gyrus. Multi, also multimodal, multimodal, uh, interrelates somatosensory, auditory, and visual acknowledges, acknowledgement of sensory stimuli. Okay. Once again, lesions, a stereognosial loss of the ability to recognize form, texture, and size of an object. <laughs> so once again, loss of body schema in regards to losing these sensations. So once again, it can create a contralateral hemispatial memory. So because of the visual overlying problems here, they really have no idea of what's in front of them, okay? So going back to the person with the mirror, they can see the mirror. They don't recognize that there's a problem with their face or their hair or that they got half a beard. Why did they get half a beard? Because he didn't recognize he was growing a beard. 
But he was really, you notice, he was really cool about getting it right down the midline. I don't know if somebody held him. Maybe for the pitch. Okay, so they have a practice, inability to perform a purposeful movement. Okay. So here's some types of lay practice. Connect. Inability to perform a fine or skilled movements of one extremity uh, contralaterally and in basically uh, a lesion could be a lesion in the area. Okay, so once again, the ability to recognize what you're doing in relationship to someone asking you to your performance, this type of movement. I be a motor. This is classic right? This is okay. There's a hammer here. There's a nail here. There's a board here. Um, or someone, um, someone who asked me to button their shirt. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't button their shirt. They cannot do that movement pattern, that motor movement pattern. They've lost the ability to do that based upon area area forty or so. There's a vast amount of lesions that come together, okay? We're going to talk about the vast lesions. The lateral side of the cerebral cortex, probably three-fourths of it is supplied by the middle, uh, middle cerebral artery. If you, get, if you get a blockage or a bleed in that artery, either you're going to die or you're not going to be able to do much. Anymore. You're really going to be out of sorts. Inability to move, inability to speak, okay? Inability to perform movement patterns and so forth. Because that artery supplies the majority of these gyral areas. Okay, so. Okay, ideation characterized by the inability to formulate or conceptualize. They cannot create the image of a required movement. So you ask them to tell you, okay, what do you, what do you think this movement is? I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Okay, so not, there's no hammer there, there's no, or, or you can ask them, there's a hammer, there's a nail, there's a board. What do you do with this? I don't know. What do you do? Okay, they have no ability to conceptualize the movement pattern that they are, you're asking them to that's an ecraxia. Buckle oral facial. It's kind of you know cross over. You get strokes, you can have facial palsies, uh, you can get lesions of facial nerve. I mean that's not this. This is basically, you know, you ask someone, you ask someone to smile, okay? You ask someone to smile and you can't do it. This can also be, for example, overlapping in a disease like Parkinson's disease, because they have this mad asthma obstruction. Okay, they can't move their facial muscles. Move their vision muscles. So whether or not that's Parkinson's disease or paralysis agitans or a lesion in this in this area. Okay. Here's the sensory hormones. Now similar but different. Look at, I mean the hand, the trunk, the leg, the feet, okay, they're not too much different in terms of shape or size. The head face is still large, okay? The tongue is even larger than it was in the area of motor hormones, okay? So these are areas of significant sensory input that we get. We are, in, in our face, in our oral cavity, in our tongue, we are really, you know, in, in one way, very tactily, de tactily defensive, okay? And you don't like that, your patients do not like you putting their, your hands in their mouth. Okay, that's always a problem. Uh, but these, especially you have a child, I'm not open for you. Okay, but you are going to have adults that react the same. This isn't necessarily a lesion. This is a habit. This is a this is a related behavior. Okay, behind the supermarginal gyrus is area forty. This is also interesting. Angular gyrus because it has kind of an angle at the corner of the lower parietal lobe where it comes in contact with the posterior 
Superior Temple Chapels. So this is related to things like the interpretation and expression of language by a visual stimuli. Right behind it is the visual cortex, is the occipital. Down behind it, and down below it, is some this vernix area, which has to do with being able to put wounds in the right place. Okay? So, conversion of syllables to sounds. Okay? So, taking a syllable, and I sometimes say after a little bit, I just kind of try and put the word in it. But, inability to read. This is called a dyslexia or an alexia. You just cannot understand how those words sound or how they should be pronounced. A graphic, the inability to write. Okay? I talked to you the other day about this phase of nuclear disease called Parkinson's. I'm well, not Parkinson's. Uh, uh, called I lost it. <laughs> okay. Oh, cerebral palsy. Okay, these people have difficulty doing, for example, finite writing, like um, you know, cursive writing. Okay. Um, so that is that can be caused by early defects, early disabilities, defects, early memory. Right and left confusion, right backwards, writing letters backwards, writing sentences. So in this area, we see some things associated with our ability to communicate. Occipital lobe, primarily the visual cortex. This is Broadman's area 17. If you get a, if you cut an optic nerve, if you cut an optic nerve, and you have blindness, okay, where would the areas be affected? How does the optic nerve go? You know, on one side, it goes from the medial side of the retina and crosses over to the opposite side. Okay. On the other side, it comes from the lateral side of the retina and crosses over. It doesn't cross over, it goes to the same side. So you kind of have a lesion where you have a defect in your ability to see things that are temporally on one eye, but also on the other eye, you have a lesion in your relationship to being able to see things in front of you or nasal. So that's that's a hemianopia. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about vision. It's really a neat mix. Okay. Visual association cortex are directly in front of the, the back of the occipital lobe. These are area 18 and 19, posterior parietal cortex. Okay. Lesions here can cause the individual not to really see what they're looking at. What we call a visual hallucination. Okay? A visual hallucination. This can be associated with pathways that are coming from the prefrontal area and going back to the occipital area. Okay? Or a condition called prosopagnosia. There's another thing called statagnosia. Prosopagnosia. The loss of the recognition of your face. Okay? And this kind of happens to you when you go to Rick Teams after 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, everybody sort of asks, what's that back I have no idea what they're looking, who they're looking at. So it's, it's John and John. All right, but you lose the ability. You don't know who you're looking at. Now, if that person starts to speak to you, it's very likely that if you recognize their voice, you will know who is in front of you. But visually, you cannot define who is in front of you. So that's a loss. That's a loss of recognition, visual recognition. Gyrus, but back in the back of the superior temporal gyrus or Heschel's gyrus, 
just in front of the atsibo. This is called Burnett's nerve, or Burnett's receptive speech nerve. Okay. This is connected by the arcuate gyrus to Broca's expressive speech nerve. Okay. So this area in here, Broca's area, Broadman's area 30, 37, also plays a role in here in the anterior temporal gyrus. Okay. The lesion here causes receptive aphasia, the loss of the ability to comprehend what is it you want to say. Can you speak? Can you make sounds? Yeah. But you go and you're going to say something to somebody and you get you get a such a conversation. Uh, Hi, John. Where are you? Is that a table in front of you? What's going on with the sky? Is that a bird flying by? So the sentence makes literally, I don't know if it makes sense to you, uh, make no sense in relationship to trying to put, because words are flowing out like they're flowing out into a bowl. So sometimes they call this a speech sound. A speech sound. And this is what we call, what we call receptive aphasia, the inability to understand the words that we want to say. Expressive aphasia is the we know the words we want to say, but we cannot pronounce them properly or at all. Okay. All right, the insula is the emotional cortex. I think, I think Dr. McGuire is going to talk about the speech and consciousness. I think you're talking about the living system. Okay, so it's interesting stuff, okay? So uh, you're, you're 